Hey everyone, happy to have you here for another episode of Legacy Matters. Today, as usual, we will talk about whatever comes up with a slight leaning toward discussions of preserving your legacy, preparing for things to come, and sharing stories we find amusing. We haven't done this in a while, it feels like. I was like. just going to say that. Yeah, where are you? Well, and I, I can't stole hear myself because I don't have headphones. I... Is your mic on? Oh, you can't Is hear. It? Yeah, you're good. Oh, okay. I keep talking. So anyway, welcome to Legacy <laughs> Matters podcast. Welcome to Legacy Matters. Hi, Thanks for tuning Sarah in. And Sam. <laughs> Hi. Welcome. Thanks for listening. Um, just a reminder to subscribe. Oh yeah. And share and like us on your podcast uh, platform of choice. That Whoever really you helps may be. Us. And we also have a new Legacy Matters <laughs> podcast. Facebook page. Ooh. Ooh, how exciting. <laughs> Ooh. And Instagram. You know, well, it's one, coming that's along. That's still more popular than Facebook. Sure. So anyway, check us out there. And uh, Jim, weather? Weather. Okay. Well, it's we got a couple so days easy. after Christmas now, mm-hmm. after the sort of that holiday, anyhow. Mm-hmm. A um, couple days before New Year's Eve. And it is snowing today. Snowing. We are still in December and it's... It's really snowing today. So we might really get, you know, snowing. like six inches okay. today. That's so, what I hear. Yeah. I mean, it's like a winter, it's a winter, it's a winter you wonderland. Actually, you actually have a weather update this <laughs> I time. I do. I do. Sometimes, I, sometimes you know, it's, it's just, pretty good. Sometimes kind of it's eventful. totally BS, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, today it's, you know, chilly and snowy and snowing and and uh, like snow freezing. winter storm advisory until like 11 p.m and right it's, it's right early so that so, must mean we're gonna get some yep so it's still in the morning before noon so we're cutting out early today <laughs> oh we are are we <laughs> we are <laughs> i was the last one in the studio this morning so i guess i can't right like yeah. I, I have to be the last to leave then right yep so well, whatever <laughs> uh good christmas you guys real quick <clears throat> great great, yeah. great yeah. holidays yep, yep. Yeah, I mean, that's why we haven't done this in a little while mm-hmm. and why we haven't been in here working on, feverishly working on preserving everyone's memories. Right. Right. Trying. Trying. Working on it. Um, all right. Well, is it me? I should do this. You should do all it. All right. We have our guest. <laughs> we have a guest to introduce who's been all so quiet over there. Okay. So, Mari. Yes. Right? Free slaving. Good job. Yes. Wow. Oh, yeah. nice. You're doing it. Yes. For a Monday morning. <laughs> Mari, welcome. Thank yes, you. thanks for thanks coming for coming in, in on yeah. this snowy winter wonderland. Yeah, yes. thanks for coming into what I don't know what I'm coming into. That's right? exactly right. <laughs> yep. Well, that's like every day going into school, isn't it? Not quite. I have a little bit more trepidation here. Do you? Uh-huh. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's oh, it's so easy. We're easy. All right. Yeah, so nothing yeah. scary about this in the end. You're a high school principal. I am. Yeah, where are you at? Oh. I'm at North Community High School in Minneapolis. Okay. And how long have you been there? I've been there just a few months. Oh, just a few oh, months. Oh, you are fresh. Fresh. Oh, but you were somewhere else then before this. I was. Administering as well? Yep. I've been in Minneapolis Public Schools my whole life, I like to say. I'm okay. 25. And really? And I started kindergarten when I was four. So I don't really know anything different. <laughs> I suppose that, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm getting this. Yeah. <laughs> I've counted, um, I think with the number of schools that I've been a student in, a teacher or an administrator in Minneapolis Public Schools, I th- I'm in the high teens, so I'm like somewhere around 17 or 18 okay. Minneapolis Public Schools wow. that I've either been a student in or taught in. Or what kind of teacher were you? In. I was a middle school teacher. Okay. Ooh. Middle school English. Like yes. what grade? Middle school, like sixth, seventh, eighth? Sixth, seventh, eighth. Loved it. Yeah? Absolutely loved it. Um, wouldn't have traded those years for anything. I've got a kid in seventh grade right now. You know, it's completely different parenting. Um, I He's was kind of a pain in the butt. Yeah. So I was convinced <laughs> that um, because I, I worked so well with that grade level yeah. that I was going to parent really well with that yeah. grade level. Oh, yeah. That was an assumption that I made um, that was inaccurate. Okay. <laughs> and um, my oldest daughter is uh, 24, and I'm very grateful that um, she survived and that she's still alive, as am I, after getting through the middle school years. And then um, our baby. Yeah. is a uh, eighth grader right now so mm. we're okay. almost on the other end of the middle school years from right. a parent perspective it's okay. tough we t- we've talked about that before in the podcast about middle school being and especially i'm going to speak for women but it's a tough age because i think it's you're really hard and you're you're dealing with a lot of peer pressure and you're trying to figure yourself out and get acceptance too from 
your peer group? The digital oh. age has oh, complicated sure it beyond my wildest imaginations. Mm. Um, what all of the kids, but especially the girls, are dealing with as far as their identity, mm-hmm. who they are, uh-huh. um, is exacerbated uh-huh. by social media um, and how quickly um, other kids can weigh in. Mm-hmm. Um, and oh, even, not feedback. for the betterment. Right. Not for the betterment. Right. We were actually, um, my husband is sitting over here to my right. He had to drive you in today because there's snow. He had to drive me in because there's snow. We were talking about, um, we've only been married for two years. Okay. And um, I'm 45 and he's 57. And so... Uh, <laughs> Right on. You don't look yeah. 57. Does, no. Oh, not you don't look 45 either. Keep, keep, it, keep it coming, Sarah. Uh, his head's already big enough. But, uh, we are both uh, really blessed. I think there's something really special about finding love um, maybe later in life. Uh-huh. And so I was teasing him the other day. I was asking him what he's adjusted to. You know, I said, I've adjusted to loading the dishwasher differently. Mm. And oh, I feel that's like a huge I, one uh-huh. for married couples. That's huge. Uh-huh. And I it's feel like, like the, I should uh, have, number one. I know. I, I really, <laughs> I'm waiting for the accolades for that because I think that's a really big deal. It's coming. Yeah, you um, deserve it. Is. Yeah. So you changed your method? I changed my method because he of was too rigid about it. He, it had to be a certain way, he but I get it. He claimed that he did not <laughs> expect me to change my method mm-hmm. of dishwashing it's and loading, just like, um, but it was quietly there. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, it was a subliminal right. expectation. Yeah, um, but one thing that <laughs> I have adjusted to is um, not having to drive in uh, Minnesota snow. Oh, oh been, because you. Driving, he drives. That's really that's, so. You used to that's drive. That's really great. Yeah, and you, you, I was a single mom, so I raised my kids, yeah. and um, I was raised by a single mom, and and so, um, and my mom is from Minnesota. My dad is not, and so my mom is very comfortable and familiar with driving mm-hmm. through blizzards. And so I just that's all I knew that women did, and strong women just got behind the wheel. And you know, if you ended up in a ditch, then you know you tried to. Uh, acclimate and adapt yeah and right. i have really enjoyed getting in the passenger side of a vehicle wow and not worrying about driving you're still a strong woman even though you're on the I passenger know, side right like i'm even stronger <laughs> to, be able to admit that right, <laughs> right. yes well you are yeah. i mean that's a nice that's very nice because i mean driving in minnesota I is a driving. art in all yeah. all its own I love it. skills it how I mean, did you guys do on sorry jim how did you guys do on saturday with the ice did you just stay put no we actually were in pequot lakes minnesota um my husband is the girls basketball coach for north community High School. Okay. Okay. okay he likes to tell people he was there before me okay. yeah because um, that's <laughs> was he that's, he was but okay i'm learning that's really important for a man <laughs> uh to be able to say that he okay. for some reason he's was, laughing Wait a minute by the now, way let's not stereotype <laughs> sorry sam but um he uh he went uh to north high school last year my okay. husband um served in the minneapolis police department for 30 years ah, and, oh. then, uh, and that's how we met actually uh, because i was a principal at lucy laney and i think that's how kate that's probably how kate found that's that's out. oh yeah that's right yes um so he we were you, in pequot you, lakes okay for a girls basketball tournament okay. christmas tournament uh-huh. and we were making the decision on whether we were going to drive back to the cities that's or not. a tough one right yeah because it was snowing up there and it was drivable but it was a skating rink down here yeah it was horrible. absolute we didn't leave the house yesterday well there was a no travel advisor yeah, yeah. i mean yep. they were basically coming out and saying do not travel yeah, buses stop yeah and i was everything. looking at 20 teenage girls going we are going to travel <laughs> we are not going so to you guys here in Pequot <laughs> all right okay so you did it who was we driving we actually had a super great bus driver his name okay. was Jim Jim is 73 years old and he loves getting uh north assignments I think it's because he likes to sit and chit chat with my husband in the front seat of the bus sure. um but uh Jim did a great job and got us all home safe and sound mm-hmm. we passed a couple people in ditches but mm-hmm. He kept us on the straight and narrow. Mm-hmm. That is that's quite an accomplishment. Yeah, so from that's yesterday. where we were okay. on, on Saturday. Right. Okay. Yeah. So Lucy Laney, that's where Kate knows. <clears throat> yeah, cause that's right. I remember now sort of this story. And, and you won some accolades for your work there. Is that right? Well, I'm not sure that I won some acc- or accolades. Or the school did? I would say 
um, the school started to change under my leadership. Okay. And that change started to generate a lot of attention. And, um, but it was definitely a united effort. You mean it was a group effort? You didn't do it all yourself? Absolutely. <laughs> Not at all. Far from it. Um, and it, it changed to the point where it, uh, there were a couple of um, local journalists for um, CARE 11 that pitched a story a few years ago to their news director and then brought it to myself and our superintendent. And they asked if they could be embedded in the school. Okay. Um, and their original plan was if they could spend one to two days a week in the school um, miking me up mm-hmm. and um, others kind of on an as-needed basis and um, capturing what was happening. I think education is still a mystery to so many people. And um, they wanted to see you know, what was happening here and could we crack the code? After months, and originally what they were doing is they were producing and um, airing these little mini episodes and they were calling them lessons from Lainey. And they were, um, I thought they were great. Mm -hmm. But what they ended up finding by about this time in the school year was that they had hundreds of hours of footage and um, there was a story that was unfolding. And so uh, they kind of circled the wagons, came back and said, we think we have enough for a documentary. Mm -hmm. Neither journalist had done a documentary before, um, but they started bringing some people in who could kind of look at what they had. And uh, they ended up producing a documentary. And it's um, it's now won some significant awards, in fact, it has won the Columbia DuPont, which is the Pulitzer for broadcast journalism. Oh. <laughs> and I know, I didn't wow. know this. I know this these is things what now. what happens when you don't do any research. I know. That's why when I oh walked God, in, yes. I was like, oh, hi. Okay. Yeah. Right. And you guys what? were like, hi, you're at uh, what school what? again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, That's the way we roll. I love it, know. though. I mean, yeah. it's like, it's, 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 it's interesting. It's, it's like you're a new neighbor it, and you came right, over right. and we're at the and kitchen table. Got you I know. That's kind That's of what, what it is. Well, not only that. No, seriously. So I'm sitting here, and I, it's like, it's like the SNL skit. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, every day like, is one? SNL over here. <laughs> like the the very um, much so. the Alec Baldwin, yes, right? The two women, um, yes, from I, the nineties. I oh, and I remember? yeah, and I don't want to say it because I feel like my mom will be disappointed in me. <laughs> um, you can swear on this. Well, but. I don't, and but I don't. But they call it, it's the sweaty ball. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Episode, yeah. I know. Yep. Yep. Sweaty balls. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Sam said it. I said it for you. Yeah. Because your voice, you're you're very you know calm. Chill. Like, you got a lot of chill. That's right? they they're sort of it making works with students. I bet. I it does. Yeah. 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 yeah that show was sort to. of uh, making fun of the Canadian. Uh, was it? Yeah. What's the? It's. I love that show, but uh, Fresh Air. Yes. Right. Oh. With Terry Gross or right. whatever. And, yeah. Yes. And the Canadian, and she just always had that voice. And it all works Canadian today. Stick, but it's great. It's, it's really, great knowing it's you've got perfect. your well, Bob McKenzie <laughs> out She has her plaid on. I'm thinking right. the listening it's audience the Bob has no McKenzie. idea. He, you I might know. not know that. but And guess what? I went to a hockey game last night. <laughs> uh, she's so it's like, all Canadian. Uh, yeah. Oh. I don't know how. Yeah, well, you're just all sporty yeah, and Minnesota. No, and <laughs> can I can I tell you guys, uh, being, being Minnesotan and Wisconsinite, um, she's a Wisconsinite. But we're uh, what? Yeah, I, know. I no longer want to do, do this show anymore. I know. I know. <laughs> I, know. I shouldn't have told I've you. Changed my mind. Are I you mad about the you. football game? Mad. Mad doesn't even <laughs> begin to describe. <laughs> the, o- the only thing worse is if she lived in St. Paul now. <laughs> oh. You know. well, what I was going to say is there isn't Whoa. as much difference between us and Canadians as we maybe think. Like well, there the are fact neighbors. that we, I know there are really close neighbors. Hmm. Not all of them. You Some know of them what are I look like there. today. Some Not to make this about me, but I feel like um, I lived in New York for a long time, and it's like all the hipsters in Brooklyn started mm-hmm. dressing like they lived in Northern Wisconsin. Yeah, I know. You know? I noticed I'm like, that. No, that's I grew up with that. It's nice to be trendy every once in a while. I guess you're working it today. Am I? And I just yeah, think the are. listening you're, audience you, you has look, no idea. Right? Oh, she's much picture. more trendy than this usually. This is. Oh, 
This is just sort this, of like Sarah got up and Minnesota threw on whatever she could find. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm not. Never mind. Right. <laughs> I'm not saying a word. Okay. Anyways. That's okay. Um, so we're getting to know you. So you work. Uh, so, uh, so, this, so the documentary yeah, is about the, the school. What's the name of the documentary? It's called Love Them First. Love Them Love First. Them first. Oh. Okay. And the reason behind that name? Ooh. I I um I wasn't a fan of the name, actually. And I mentioned it to... So, the journalists are Ben Garvin and Lindsay Siebert. Um, Lindsay was much more in front of the camera at CARE, and Ben was much more behind the camera. Um, Both of them have great careers in uh, journalism. Ben was in print journalism for a while. Photography is... Um, kind of his area of expertise. Lindsay's always been in broadcast journalism. Both of them, um, you know, married with children. Both of them have children in Minneapolis public schools. And then both of them ended up covering different stories at Lucy Laney. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they covered the stories were just kind of struck with what they experienced when they walked into the building. And, and, what I ascertain from what struck them is a few things, and I don't know that they've ever come out and said this, so if if they listen and they disagree, then um, chuck okay. it to my to my uh, you know head and not my heart. but <laughs> they uh, I think what struck them is um, I think that there is a, almost a subconscious expectation when you walk into a public school in North Minneapolis that um, you expect to encounter uh, some sort of depressive state mm. or frame or atmosphere. Like from the children or from the from staff? Everybody. From everybody. The whole, the whole works? <clears throat> yeah, I think we're very socially primed to expect something um, very negative. Not positive. Because it's a public... Because, because it's, it's a public North Minneapolis school public specifically, the, it, it because a public school in maybe a, a, a more Im, impoverished pocket of our community, um, and and that's not what you encounter when you walk in. Sure. And so I think it kind of surprises people, and then especially parents, white parents like Ben and Lindsay, who walk into their more white schools on a regular basis with their children not only when they walked into lucy laney did they encounter an atmosphere of joy but they also encountered an atmosphere of more joy than their children were experiencing Mm -hmm. which i think flips that socially primed script yeah um and it it caused them to want to spend more time there and see if they could figure out why that was so they were. So they they kind of came up with the love them first thing, is what you. They thinking. did, and when they brought it to me, when they said that 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 they were going to name it love them first, I was like, "Ew, I don't like that." <laughs> um, I I just I have a sensitivity to um, this kind of like bleeding heart. Saffron, like a very, like, yeah, yeah, like a savior mentality, mm. like oh, and I, 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 I noted noticed it when I was a young teacher, and I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but I remember being a young teacher and looking at some of my teaching colleagues in in classrooms around me, and especially kind of like these young you know, white women that had watched Freedom Writers and they were going to, you know, come in and they were just going to save the black hmm. children. And 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 the kids would, you know, write their name at the top of their paper and they would be like, oh, you did a great job writing your name. I love it. Mm-hmm. I love it. Mm-hmm. And I'd be like, what are you <laughs> like doing? Like we can expect That's a little not, more than absolutely. just that. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and so when they first told me that that was going to be the name of the film, and I was very hands-off that they gave me a lot of um, opportunity to influence, and I felt really strongly going into it that that was not my role. Um, It wasn't comfortable, I think, for me or the staff, um, or even the parents or the students sometimes, to be under the camera lens like that. Very unprecedented. I've heard from a lot of people nationally that and no one has just ever seen that before, especially a public school, where you just open your doors and you allow 
the cameras and the microphones to pick up whatever they're going to pick up. Um, but I, I, I didn't, I didn't feel comfortable about that being the the message, and so it was one of one of the few times when I kind of put my hands in it and said, "Well, you know, why that? Why that title?" And they said, "Mar, you say that, mm-hmm. like we have you on camera saying that." And I was like, "Shoot, well, all right, <laughs> <laughs> there you go." I guess if you said it, right? I, right. How did and more you say than it? Once. Like, right. how do you yeah, say it? Like, so, context. so the context was. Um, <laughs> Well, let me go back and say why I'd, more why I didn't like the mm-hmm. the title, and then I'll give you the context. So, um, I feel really strongly that there's, you know, there's different types of love, and the kind of love that I think I was referring to when I used it in context was um, almost like a a real love, a hard love, a tough love, like. I love you enough to fight for you. I love you enough to hold you accountable. Mm-hmm. I love you enough to have high standards for you. Mm-hmm. I love you enough to make, you know, my life complicated and in order to create a better outcome for your life. I love you enough for sacrifice because I think that um, love is sacrificial and when you do love someone, you sacrifice for them. And you sacrifice for them not because you'll be better for it, but because they'll be better for it. Mm-hmm. And so when I was using it in context, that's the context that I was using it in, that if we as a society or if we as educators, if we as public educators, and this is for all children, because the way that we do school is not developmentally appropriate at all. It's not compassionate to children. Um, it's It's been proven multiple times that it fits one type of kid and one type of learning style and can um, really do a lot of damage, lifelong damage. We, we talk about our upbringings and yeah. and not necessarily fitting into the schools we were at. Yeah. And, you know, whether it's rote learning or or just kind of the the traditional model that always was like right. i know i couldn't wait to get out of school in so many ways and i know he felt that way too i don't know yeah how definitely and so way. i've got step kids that are that are at southwest um they just graduated actually so um and you know and then i went to cooper which isn't far yeah um but you know it's interesting how how i feel like some kids just are so under the radar right you know what i mean and then other kids are you know, I know some kids that are probably struggling quite a bit right now. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, once you get in that mode, it's hard to it's hard to navigate. You know, it is hard to navigate, and I would argue that um, as a society and as a culture, we have um, we have patience more patience for some than for others. Yep, um, I do think it's a a, a different level of expectation um, for kids of color. Mm-hmm. I, I, of course, you know, it is. Yeah. M- Minnesota um, has pride, prided itself for generations on having high academic standards and um, high academic expectations. And yet, what we've known over the last five to ten years is that Minnesota also has one of the largest, if not the largest, achievement gaps in the United mm-hmm. States of America mm-hmm. between white and black children in particular. And yet, everyone stops right there. They just put the period there, and then they stop. And they don't go any further. And uh, it is that is an exhausting reality for those of us in education, for those of us that um, are people of color, for those of us that are raising children of color, um, to just stop there. And Do you feel done. like that's changing at all, though? No. No, you don't feel like it's changing. I, no. The only reason I I ask is because the, you know, we do this show and some of the things that I've seen. I don't know that. I don't know how quickly it can actually change because the, like the mechanisms of change are so slow in mm-hmm. in so many ways sometimes. But like, uh, Chris Coleman was on, and Chris Coleman was talking about the racial inequity in housing after World War II. Right. And and how Minnesota glossed over that for so long. And we've been doing a little work with the Chalkbee Metawakton. There's these things that I feel like, though the, 
the change isn't here yet. The change that I see is in the fact that it's been we could have it's a conversation, a lot more conversations, Hopefully. and a lot, a lot more present conversations, and a lot more uh, conversations amongst people who uh, of from differing backgrounds, where it actually comes out into the light. Then, which to me is, it's shitty that you have to wait so long for everything to change. But that's like at least, at least it's not just wow, that's that happens. Like it's let's get. What can we do to yeah, start I'm, working on it? I'm, I think it's an uncomfortableness. Wouldn't you like people don't so, want to address it? Well, so I'll go back to what. So your question is: it changing? Um, and I and and I said no. But what I will say is, um, I'll change that to yes and no. How about sure. That? Yeah. Fair. So, fair. So <laughs> so to your point, um, and this is one thing that I strive to do with the educators that I work with because I think it's very freeing to think of things in a historical context Um, and I think what you're getting to Sam is a historical context yeah and if you think about um, just who we are from from a historical perspective as the United States of America it's actually amazing that our native and african american communities are still alive first of yeah. all um with the number of strategic and purposeful attempts at annihilation right yeah, like the, absolutely. the bottom line is oppression now, annihilation uh, destruction and in some ways you, you know of. some might argue barely alive okay yeah um because of the level of ongoing complications but um but what fighters right to still be here now if you look at that through a lens of education the way that we do getting back to kind of this i call it like the square peg in the round hole right Mm -hmm. um education was was never intended for everybody not at the the same level ever no and i think it's so silly because sometimes we you know beat ourselves up for um not being able to see everyone uh you know, uh, produce at the same level, but it, it was never intended to be that way. The one room schoolhouse was never for everybody ever. Right. Mm-hmm. It was for the, the selected few. And, um, you know, if you were a farmer's child, you weren't included in that mix. If you were the son of a blacksmith, you weren't included in that mix. You might go for a few years and then you moved into an apprenticeship with your father. And so it, and and that's removing race from the it, because, e- equation altogether. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because there's there's as much <clears throat> oppression. Uh, the ec- socioeconomic divide is as much oppressing at times as as other things. You know, Absolutely. It's, and that's that's been, you know, you're going to make me cry about this, right? Because it's not, it's it's the wasted talent. It's mm-hmm. not the it's not. Okay, so you give everybody the opportunity, right? But like, what have we missed out on in our society? What have what have what has the world missed out on by us choosing to see things through the wrong lens like that? Like, like there should be a divide because you're black, you're native, you're you're a farm poor, kid, you're yeah. a blacksmith, you're poor, you're you know. No, the, we should be educating all of the kids, and not everyone's going to achieve the same. That's fine. Not everyone's going to do exactly all the same stuff, mm-hmm. but. But given the opportunity, there's going to be, you know, there's just a, there's a lot of missed opportunity that's happening. Well, not only what have we missed out on, what have we silenced? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What, I mean, what have, what have we, what have we killed? Mm-hmm. What have yeah. we tortured? Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, so when you add on top of that, so take that and then add race and you look at um, the African and the Native American communities experiences with education as we know it they are the two most violent experiences with education Mm -hmm. so if you study you know what is the history of american public education with native americans what 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 comes up if you google that what comes up uh the history of native american education native americans in american education the orphanage or the um the boarding schools, yeah, the, boarding the forced, schools. forced forced separation, forced from families. Sep- so forced separation, mm-hmm. yeah. Residential. What else? Strict. Uh, Strict. They made well. I know authoritarian. they changed their uh, their 
um, appearance. Appearance, yes. Yeah, took their culture, clothes. Yeah. Cultural, yeah, cultural destination. Shaved, shaved uh-huh. their heads. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. And then and then what about with, with African Americans what during during slavery? What was Was it? there any education? No. In I fact mean, <laughs> in fact you could right. you could die for knowing how to read. for knowing how to read. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yet we read these headlines that talk about how Native and African American children are not succeeding mm-hmm. to the level mm-hmm. that they should be succeeding. Are you kidding me? We have the most deeply violent rooted history with American education and we expect to be able to flip a switch, all of a sudden we're gonna flip a coin and now all of a sudden these children and their parents and their grandparents and this generational ancestral history of complete violence and torture Mm -hmm. is going to completely dissipate and they're going to come out and coming to school and say, yes I can. Everything's gonna be great. That's absolutely ridiculous. So, so I'm, we're we're getting close to I just have a couple of quick questions cuz I'm kind of a shit about this stuff, right? I'll admit it. Um when you said, you know, what have we missed by by brutalizing and I know you're right about that. Um I also wonder because because mine is a my history is uh my grandmother was a an Irish immigrant and an orphan in New York and you know, took a train to Minnesota and I there's privilege all over that, and there's also horror all over it. Everything's, you know, it's kind of both. Um, I wonder sometimes, like, if there isn't a little mix of, of both inspiration and oppression sometimes, mm-hmm. too. I wonder how many people have been inspired by, because they are, it, they are capable, and they are human, and they're mm-hmm. all, they're, they don't, they don't, just because you're told that you don't possess the intellect to, to hang with the other group or something doesn't mean that you actually don't. And there's Mm -hmm. been some inspiring things that have happened too, which certainly do not outweigh the, Mm -hmm. uh, the tragedies. But I I just think that it's worth, it's worth thinking about. There's always, it's hope and, you know, yeah, because it, it comes to what extent though. I mean, to, to, to what extent? So somebody mentioned to me one time, so I would argue that, that it, if you watch the documentary, that's what a little bit about what you'll experience is um, there is a there is a sense of hope and there is a sense of optimism. But one thing that was very important to me in leading leading my staff, and I was talking to my husband about this the other day because I'm at a new building now, and so I mm-hmm. need to start, you know, start in some ways start start over again. But one thing that was very important to me is that um, who believes what. And, and, and our people who are in positions of education, being the educators, being the adults in the building, do they deeply and firmly believe that? So when they look out at a classroom full of faces staring back at them, and those faces are brown-eyed and brown-skinned, do they deeply within their soul believe that those children can meet and exceed any expectations and if they don't deeply believe that in their soul, they need to move on. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, you said it, and I, it. Another thing that I get caught with, and it, it probably isn't the best thing to say because my children could be listening, right? But I've got three of my own children, and I worked with kids for almost twenty years. And when you start talking about loving them, but loving them enough to expect good things of them, and to and to put yourself out there for them, and all the ways that you can love someone, I've. I've told people this, and I, I maybe even have mentioned it to my kids, but but I loved the thousand kids that came through the camp that I worked for. I love them. I can't really differentiate between one and another. Right. Like, and and I even have a hard time saying that that my love for any one of those kids is all that much different than the love for my own kids. No, right. granted, my kids are my kids. That's you right. know, I and there's a, but I I don't know. I'd put myself out for. For really any of them, yeah, mm-hmm. because they, and they need it, you know, they deserve it. They so. also sense it and they feel it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, one thing that I learned uh, really early on, especially about kids that had grown up in some sort of trauma, 
and experience some sort of trauma. Do you remember those pixels when you can look at a picture and you can figure oh, out yeah. and you can mm-hmm. make the picture out? Oh, yeah. yeah. You kind of squint. Kind of, you got to squint and then you go, yep. oh, it's a horse or right. oh, it's yep. a mm-hmm. um, children that have experienced any type of trauma in their lives. Um, they can pick it out like that. Oh, they can see through that fuzz? Immediately. They can pick it out like that. That's funny. And why is that? It's because they have had to learn how to do that. They have to pick up instincts right away. Mm-hmm. They have to They have to pick up demeanor right away. They have to be able to walk into a situation and sense, do mm-hmm. I need my guard up? Mm-hmm. Can I put my guard down? Right. What is, what is my expectation right now? Mm-hmm. And right. so when they can sense in you... Mm-hmm. Like I, 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 I actually I love you and I'm going to fight with you and for you like you're my own. Mm-hmm. That changes, mm-hmm. yeah. Because now they're willing to do something for you. Mm-hmm. Right. Up until that point, they might just sit back, let you do all the work. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Oh, of course, wow. yeah. Hi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we're gonna just take a quick break and we're gonna come back. This has been very fascinating. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It has been. <laughs> Let's we'll be right back. <laughs> we'll come back. Mm. Today's show is brought to you by the Andalin app, a first of its kind digital legacy preservation app that allows you to digitally attach photos, videos, and audio recordings to the places and objects you love. Imagine hearing your grandmother's voice telling the stories of your family heirlooms. Preserve your memories, prepare for the future, and share with those you love. Andalin, available in the App Store and Google Play. Visit andalin.app for more information. Need some help with a construction project? Looking for thoughtful design and honest answers about what is possible and what is not? Kinetic Design Build is a full-service boutique remodeler servicing residential and commercial clients in the Twin Cities. Design and build with purpose. Visit kineticdesignbuild.com to request a consultation. Packing for a trip? Let Pack Simply give you a little help by delivering travel-safe products directly to your door in an airport security-safe pouch. Unbelievably easy and surprisingly simple. Make your life easier. Visit packsimply.com. Interested in art? James Holmberg is both an artist and an art consultant. His strong connections in the Minnesota art world give him a unique perspective on the talented pool of artists from our region. Let James guide you to an original work that will come alive in your home. Visit jamesholmberg.com to find out more. All right. Do you want to go on a wilderness adventure with me, Sam? Or maybe you know a group of kids who could benefit from an extended break from their electronics. Or maybe you just need a break from those kids. Visit earthedfound.org for more information about how to get started. For information about becoming a sponsor of Legacy Matters, please visit LegacyMattersPodcast.com. Okay. Back. We are back. We joke because Sam's the only one that knows how to operate all of this. Yeah, they can't do it without me. So, and it's it's like I mean, all I do is I push a button. Yeah. Well, I, well. I mean, frankly, I don't want to learn. I am right there with you. You know, I mean, ignorance is bliss. It's, and I am living proof of that. I love you. I like, mean, I don't know how to do that. Yeah. Oh, Sorry. Jim. Yeah. No, I yeah. say that a lot. Jim. Yeah. Yeah. I help you out with some stuff. You. Computer Sarah's stuff. the brain. So everyone's no. so <laughs> everyone's good at something. Everyone, but then he's the look at this. This is all of his. Yeah, well, from your brain. So uh, yeah. we're back with our yes, second half here. I'm gonna yeah. just say that she's with still Mari. here. Mari. She has not left. <laughs> so you, as Mari we left it, and you know, I, we always I have assume. the conversations during the break, which mm-hmm. I love. Um, but how do you solve some of this? Mm-hmm. How do you? How do you? Oh my God! Are you really through? gonna? Are we yeah. gonna really throw that on her? A little bit, you know. I'm I, because I'm wondering, like, how do you? It and, seems and, so I, big. I, and it's a big question, of yeah. course. I'm not expecting like you to have some great answer <laughs> mm-hmm. or to mm-hmm. solve the problem. Maybe she's I don't got know, it, but but you know, I do. Uh, the experience I have with the kids in my life, you know, um, during the break, I would say, yeah, you know, when we're sitting at dinner and we talk about school every every time, you mm-hmm. know, every night, mm-hmm. and um, for sure, there's like. Yeah, this guy or this t- 
teacher, you know, like they know, Mm -hmm. you know, they're like, but then do I feel bad for the teacher? Mm -hmm. Like, are they, you know, because I think if they were sitting there, they, they would be like, well, we're, we're trying, we're (laughs) doing our best, you know? Um, I think it's absolutely solvable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I absolutely think there we go. Um, I, I wonder about our will Mm -hmm. to solve it as a society. Yep. Um, I think the discussions help the will. I think that's what I'm, what they I'm could, picking up on. But for on. whom, I guess, is my question. So what I've learned over the last couple of years since this documentary um, yeah. has kind of taken off is um, I've learned that it has, it has helped open, open people's eyes. But what I wonder about is whose eyes and is it people whose eyes were already openable. Mm-hmm. Um, is it, yeah, yeah, I mean, who who do you think's eyes aren't being open? Well, so when I say I wonder about the will, you know, the will that we have, um, the reason why I wonder about that is because some of our kids are doing just fine. In fact, they're doing really well. So even if we get back to this idea of Minnesota leading the country with the uh, largest achievement gap, um, when you peel back the data from the achievement gap in Minnesota, it's not necessarily that our kids of color are doing that much worse than kids of color in other states. It's that our white kids outperform white kids in other states. I've heard that before. Hmm. I've heard that from, in fact, I think it was LaShawn Ray that said Mm -hmm. exactly that same thing. He probably got it from me. He probably got it from you. (laughs) You heard it. You heard it here first, Mr. Ray. Um, and, And that's not that that doesn't just sit with education. You know, when you look at racial disparities, Minnesota leads the country in so many racial disparities. Um economics and employment and health care. And um, again, when you peel back those layers, the city pages just did another long expose about this. Again, it is that it really, it's great to be white in Minnesota. It really is. And so my question about the will is... Isn't it great to be white Anywhere, everywhere it, in America. It, it, I mean, it, so that's that's been so, my experience. Okay, so so then let's sit with that for a second. Yeah. So so that's why, for example, the term white privilege. I don't I don't use that term. Yeah. And the reason why I don't use that term is because, um, okay. So I'll get, tell you a little bit more about myself. So sure. my mom is from a small town. She grew up on a farm in northern Minnesota. Where? Um, Gully, G U L L Y, population eighty nine. Okay. Um, about 45 miles northwest of Bemidji. Okay. I, I lived a lot of my life in Bemidji. Okay. So. Yep. So I don't up, know that, Gully, up that direction, um, like you get on area? Highway 292 and yeah. uh, go towards um, Bagley, Faustin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. yep. Uh, you could blink and miss that Gully. Is, yep. That is, that's, that is remote. That is remote. I mean, and, desolate remote. And... Um, and I would argue very much helped shape who I am. Sure. Very much helped shape who I am. Yep. Um, that is Trump country. Oh, yeah. And, um, Without question. And that is, you know, I joke uh, with my uncle. So my mom was very young when she had me, uh, and she came to the University of Minnesota, met my father, Uh, My mom was white. My father is African-American from Irvington, New Jersey, which is a little dirty suburb of New York City. You land in LaGuardia and get on the road and you're there in the blink of an eye. My father very much, uh, you know, happy and proud to be black. And um, and 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 then and then there was then there was me. Then there was three. Right. And so when I say that the farm in Northwest Minnesota helped shape me. I I read an article one time shortly after Barack Obama had been elected president. And what, what the, the author did was she tried to peel apart. Why are there so many biracial mixed black people that have kind of circumvented these glass ceilings? And she argued that there is something about being a person of color that was intimately loved by white people and understands the humanity of white people. And that if you are um, a person of color in America, uh, 
the the white man or the white woman is is really distant and it's an enigma in some ways um and yet if you were if you came from one and you were helped raised by some you see the humanity of them Mm -hmm. they're humans they're no different Mm -hmm. and you're no different and it gives you a fearlessness. Like, I'm not afraid of you. But you're, you, so you're talking about the article. Though, I'm right? talking about the article, and I'm talking about how I think it shaped me mm-hmm. growing up mm-hmm. around my uncles who loved me to death, mm-hmm. to death, but who um, are all Trump 2020 mm-hmm. and who have enough NRA bumper stickers mm-hmm. um, <laughs> to cover the whole windshield. And if there is an Armageddon, by the way, that's where you'll find me. Right. Because uh, we will definitely be well armed. Um, <laughs> so but Trump, Trumpville up there, though, that's also public radio land in a lot of ways. Which and, is funny because because they get like... I lived a lot of my life up in Bemidji. In fact, I went to school. Well, not school. My parents lived there when I was, you know, four, five, six. So we probably knew each other when we were. Probably. Because I'm 44. I spent so. a lot of summers on my grandparents' farm. <laughs> yeah, we um, probably ran into each absolutely. other. Absolutely. I funny. watched my grandmother make yogurt. Um, we ate the food that was that was grown on the farm. and. But public radio is like, like you know, widely... Widely considered left-leaning, though it seems to be conservatively run right now, which is fine. I, I'm, right. I'm not getting into the right. the back-and-forth politics part of it. I think what public radio, it's funny to me that that uh, in in what we know to be Trump country, right, and, and especially with Trump's sort of assault on facts and information, mm-hmm. that um, generally speaking, the people are getting their information in those rural areas from public radio because it's Mm. the one thing that comes through and it's the Mm -hmm. one source you can actually trust to give you good, solid information. Right. Isn't that funny? I mean, it's sort of counter... Intuitive. Intuitive. Yeah, well, if you let my uncles tell it, you can't trust any information yeah, right. that right. comes through. From right, yet, they, that's the way yet they're full of yeah. knowledge. Like, they're mm-hmm. not all, not everybody living out in rural Minnesota is an idiot either. Mm-hmm. They've, they're they full of information. Mm-hmm. They're absorbing it from, a lot of times, public, mm-hmm. public radio. Um, and yet they'll tell you that you can't trust anything. When they're passionate. Yeah. They're passionate, they're they committed, are. they're loyal. Yeah. I think what I mean by the will, though, is that um, do we have the will to lose some of our clout mm-hmm. as an identity of, of white people in Minnesota, especially when it comes to academics and the achievement gap? You know, if you study, if, if you're bored one night, study the stereotype threat that came out of Stanford and how... Um, how much we are psychologically primed by um, by the subconscious and conscious stereotypes that we live under. Mm-hmm. And um, what we've learned from that is that it works both ways, both negatively and positively. And every time we are presented with how well um, white children are doing academically in the state of Minnesota, what stereotype threat would say is that we are reinforcing um, that superiority and uh, and that space at the top. And what it would question is, is the, the people whose eyes are openable, yes, their eyes may be opened by data, by research, by stories like the documentary about my school, but um, are they really willing? Would they really be willing? So, so, so here's a technical change that could easily happen. Um, the achievement gap is measured on a standardized test, one standardized test that's given by the state of Minnesota one time per year. Mm-hmm. That's it. Okay. Yeah. So, and we know that standardized tests, and they've been proven for for decades to be culturally and linguistically biased. Mm-hmm. And there's plenty of data and information out there that can show you how to unbias those tests. You could do things like um, you could filter the questions um, in a way that. Uh, uh, picks out um, cultural and linguistic bias. You could offer more than one answer, more than one appropriate answer, <laughs> right. right? There's like so many things. And yet I really question whether we have the will to do that. We could do it. The University of Georgia has an amazing woman by the name of Dr. Julie Washington who has proven 
that you can do it. You can take a standardized test. We're not even we're not even going to go so far as to say not to test the kids. Oh, cuz we could never say that in Minnesota, right? right? But what if we unbiased the test and we looked at some experts like Dr. Washington who have figured out how to do that? We don't do that. But you're but you're 45 years old. This is what you said, right? Uh, oh, uh, shit, I'm not supposed to say ages hey. in here. That was before, that was off cam or off the mic. Sorry. Sorry. I, we'll get rid of that. I'm embarrassed. <laughs> Are you so being? I am, believe me. <laughs> no, I think you did say it on the show. I did. Yeah. 45 yeah, years yeah, I've you been did. in Minneapolis Thank Public you. Schools. Yep, that's right. Okay, so uh, so when when we were kids, and we talk about this from time to time, when we were kids, if you were if you were in high school and someone accused someone of being gay, that was like, that was a, an extreme weapon used against people. Right. Mm -hmm. My, my 12 year old is like, Oh no, this, that, that friend of mine's gay. She, she's trans. There's, you know, this person's doing like, yet our country and these, these tests and the way (laughs) the, the parts of it, where where there's a higher up administrative effort to make things happen, mm-hmm. they're being run by it's an old it's the old by the eighty time. year olds, yeah. yeah, the seventy year olds and the eighty year olds are the ones still voting on that shit. Like, yeah. don't yeah. you think it will it's get our, better? It as, needs to be our generation. That, yes, that and then changes. it needs to be their well, generation. Be the generation. And then their generation behind us, that's, right? But I think we'll do I mean, better. Could you see that happening? I do. I I mean I oh. I really think that. Yeah, I, we I can will see do that better. Happening. I can really? see it with the kids. I mean, that I'm around a lot. Uh, you know, they are they are so different than my generation. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean that they're just they're so accepting and sort of fluid. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and this I, whole I, I this just, whole like boomer thing, like get out of the way, boomer. Mm-hmm. Like that's for real. I, and I'm not. I love you, boomers. It's all great. Mm-hmm. Whatever. But uh, they haven't even. Like, we're not going to see the, there's going to be more boomers coming 20, or 2026 through mm-hmm. 2042 or whatever their age group goes into retirement. Mm. They're not even there yet, not fully there. Uh, there's going to be more of them in retirement than there are kids or whatever being growing up. So we've got... I, my stats are always off. I don't give actual factual yeah, information here. We, 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 disclaimer. Disclaimer. There's not usual <laughs> facts behind it all. No, but there is this massive wave of people that were born. They are still running the show. Mm. And that, to me... They're a dying breed. I think they're dying. Do you guys think so, though? I do. I, I think you can... See. I'm optimistic of it. I really am. I mean, I, I really do think Have you that. been to some of these suburban and outstate high schools? Yes. yes, and I think we yes. need to... I mean, and when Roosevelt went down to... Where was it that Roosevelt went to go play basketball last season? And they hung the Make America Great Again. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm just... I'm not sure that we can base... I want to be hopeful. Yeah. But I'm just... I'm not yeah. sure that we can base what our experiences are with our kids right. in Minneapolis mm-hmm. public schools. And you're right. Mm-hmm. And and this is sort of, yep. Yep. you're right, because I'm sort of in the bubble yeah. of my own yeah. experience. Yeah. You know, so I see that and I'm like, wow. Yeah, but, but you are but I right. I lived in because, Bemidji when I was a kid too. And let me tell you, Bemidji was not going to change. It sure seemed like it was never going to change. And it is. And it's changing. Changing. It yeah. is. And, and you know what? Uh, so is Halleck. So uh, is yes. Yep. So I mean, so uh, there are a lot of small communities. Little Falls. You go to Little Falls. That was a ghost town, and and the whitest of white places you could ever imagine. The thing is that, like, I I went to school in St. Cloud, and they called it White Cloud for a reason, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And not to just talk about the racial politics of it all, but it's is a good it indicator. Changing? It's a good it indicator. It is changing. Mm-hmm. It is. And does that mean you're not going to run into pockets where it feels like? Like you're still seeing the same thing that that you didn't want to see 20 right. years before, 40 years before, 60 years before. Like, right. yes, but you know, marriage equality actually mm-hmm. happened. Mm-hmm. Not, we're, we're not taking that back. Mm-hmm. You know, people are talking about about Native American and and Black American rights and how mm-hmm. to really make a difference and change things. It's just not easy. It's gonna no, take a I, I I I agree, and I also think when was you know when was when was the brown versus board of education and 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 
at when when did we still have Jim Crow? And it really it's, is it's not that long ago. No, it's no, not. No, not at all. Not when not when but a lot of the people fighting on the other side and you gotta you gotta figure there were a lot of you know, there there were a lot of people fighting either side, right? Mm -hmm. And and it wasn't just a single culture or a single race or whatever mm -hmm. that was going race. We're all human, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Uh those changes we're still fighting over some of that mm -hmm. stuff, but it's incrementally progressing. Mm -hmm. It just sucks slow, to watch it. Slow. God, it sucks mm -hmm. to watch it. Yeah. I don't know. Oh. I, and not to say that we, you know, shouldn't be somewhat outraged all the time, but, but I, I do think that there's our future. If we're watching right now, what we're seeing is the, the, frankly, horseshit byproduct of further separation of saying these people aren't like mm -hmm. me they do this this way i do this this way like we're, well, we're we've kind of uncovered i call it the great cleansing in a way like we're being forced to look at our sins of the past now and the ugly stuff is coming out mm. yes I, and, and people are a, looking at it they i i think they are i, I do too you know and it's uncomfortable and that's why i think a lot of these discussions don't take place because people are right well afraid of we would be know, afraid of offending things. people, right? I mean, I I've gone to my I've gone to my local political stuff, mm -hmm. and despite being one of the younger people there, and this was a few years ago, even, uh, and I'm, I was the owner of a construction company, so mm -hmm. I should be by you know by mm -hmm. trade I should be conservative, mm -hmm. and and I would have to I would have to tell the old people, uh, like. Listen, you you can't just talk through me all the time if you're mm -hmm. good, like, and you can't just say that you're angry at at the other side the whole time. I don't. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to sit here and put up with that. You're mm -hmm. talking about my cousins and my mm -hmm. uncles and people I love, and yeah, their their views are different, but I'm not going to listen to yeah, it. Anger doesn't solve. Any and then problem. I've been shouted down for being like for being a white middle-aged man you don't deserve to talk anymore you should shut up and i'm like mm -hmm. but i'm on your side and i'm really I, trying my best to be a good person absolutely i feel really um strongly that there requires conversation requires mm -hmm. grappling you know if you if you look at indigenous populations if you look at ancient civilization if you go to different parts of the world you'll see people who are very comfortable grappling with things mm -hmm. you'll see people who are very comfortable wrestling with things mm -hmm. um they'll sit and talk in coffee shops you'll see the old men in in, in coffee shops with the young men and they are arguing away and they are still brothers and uncles and nephews mm -hmm. afterwards and there is no love lost mm -hmm. whatsoever. I think that it is a very Eurocentric um, characteristic trait that uh, says that we are uncomfortable mm -hmm. with wrestling and grappling. It goes back to what you said before. It's, it's, I love you enough as a right. human mm -hmm. that to argue said. with you right. Absolutely. and still love you afterward, mm -hmm. Absolutely. even though I don't agree with you. Absolutely. And it makes for a stronger, more united uh, community and culture when you can argue with each other and then still be good afterwards and still love each other afterwards. I would also add that I do think people of color in particular are much more comfortable with arguing, just period much more comfortable with arguing, much more comfortable with conflict, much more comfortable with tension. And um, white people in particular uh, really back away from that. And so now you have a lopsided table. Right. Yeah, yeah which it, that's never good. No. No. Right. And especially in Minnesota, it's the passive aggressive. Mm. Um, right. Just nature. Well, the kids what are you are talking about? We don't love, do that. Love to talk and love <laughs> to argue and love to put, you know, and it's a good thing. It's interesting. You know, oh the boys. I mean, iron yeah. sharpens iron, right? Right, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing, when you sat down, I, I want to bring this into mm -hmm. one other thing that you brought up, and that was the digital world. Mm -hmm. um, so last night I was with the boys, a group of young men, and we went to the British Aero Awards over at um, the Walker, and that is the number one commercials that happened over there mm. um, overseas. The British commercials, yeah. British commercials. Mm. And some of the commercials are public service commercials, mm -hmm. too. And one thing that was pretty heavy this year was um, sort of like self-awareness and bullying, especially mm. with women. Mm. And, you know, the commercials were quite moving and, mm. and really heavy. And mm. it showed, 
examples of young girls, young women, Mm -hmm. high school, middle school, in that sort of digital world where they're bullied and body Mm -hmm. issues and, um, you know, sitting there with my the kids, the young guys. I mean, we discussed that quite a bit at dinner afterwards. Mm-hmm. You know, like what, what commercials. Was their take? They just thought they thought it was very, very relative. They were like, "Yeah, they're like this happens all the time." And, it does. And you know, they're very aware of their peers, their you know female peers, yes. and the difficulty that they face. Yes. You know, and the and the struggle with. Um, you know, mm-hmm. this device. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So is there something, when you sat down, you kind of mm-hmm. said that you had never expected the digital world to have such an influence. I didn't. We were actually watching a few minutes of This is the 80s uh, last mm-hmm. night. Which I and love. <laughs> I know. And they were reminding us what the original cell phones used to look like. You know, a big mm-hmm. break. Oh, a God, big yeah. break that you Gordon held up Decker, to. Your, yeah. 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 Um, but arguing that there has been no invention in in the human age that has changed humanity like the cell phone has, um, not in a short period of time. No, and so it it is it is painful um, to watch. What I would argue is that, um, and ov- over the years of working, <laughs> I'm with optimistic. Kids, I know Sam has <laughs> to be optimistic. Um, so I, so one thing that I've noticed and that I've just this is just through my own personal experiences, family experiences, and then obviously as an educator is mental health and physical health really aren't that different from each other. Mm-hmm. You know, just mm-hmm. like um, just like physically, you know, mentally you can uh, do really well and be great and you're exercising and you're eating well and, um, and you're strong. And then there's times where maybe you're not taking care of yourself. Um, times when maybe you have a cold, you know, and you're just a little under the weather. And maybe there's times when you really have something serious and you need to, you you need to be, um, attended to. Um, and so I, I think in some ways, um, we don't really know how to talk about that when you don't feel well mentally, like we're really comfortable being like, Oh yeah, I'm fighting the flu, you know, physically or, um, but We're when clearly you're, horseshit at that in America, yeah, to be when honest. You're in a, <laughs> when you're in a an, in a dark place, yeah. mentally we we don't really know how to There's let it be known. Still yeah, to it. and how to yeah. be like, you know what? That's okay. Like yeah. you'll ride this out. You'll be okay. Like we have this immediate reaction. Like, oh my gosh, we need to fix you right away. Like mm-hmm. you know, if you have a cold, you just need to drink a lot of fluids, and it's, yeah. you got to ride it out for a few days. And 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 yet we don't really know how to do that emotionally or or mentally either. Just give people an opportunity to think about how they can ride that out as well. And so with kids, that really emerges mm-hmm. because we panic, we freak out, and so then they don't really know how to process mm-hmm. or talk through some of their issues. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we don't. One thing that I've learned, especially working with adolescents, is we don't really know the difference between like, I don't want to live and I want to die, and those are two very different places sure. to be in. And so, you know, the I don't want to live this life turns into oh my God, my child is suicidal, and then you know, then people just, then they really panic, and now you've just exacerbated the situation, right? So one thing, especially with the digital age, though, that has kind of taken me aback and so many of my my fellow parents and colleagues is especially with girls um and their identities Mm -hmm. and how hyper sexualized the digital Mm -hmm. um age is and the their questions around who are they and um boys boys like girls who kiss girls so should i be a girl who kiss kisses girls like i don't know and if i kiss a girl will will more will i have more likes and wait a minute that felt good to kiss a girl am i gay like their their minds are dealing with these big thoughts and these big emotions and these big clashes of identity and we are not prepared because so many of us have not gone through this digital age Mm -hmm. we are not prepared to walk them through this journey is what is at least the way i'm feeling both as an educator of adolescents and as a parent of one Mm -hmm. i mean that's a nice way to put it it very well i mean how do you walk through someone that (laughs) that you haven't walked through i'm optimistic 
Yeah. I'm still well, optimistic no, because here's what can... I think happened. I, I, but honestly, I think what happened, just like with any new technology, and cell phones have, without question, changed our lives in more ways than than any single invention. Yes. So far, it, but but a lot of it is that they're an amalgamation of a bunch of different inventions that we actually already have had for a long time. It's just it's a camera. It's a really good camera. Mm-hmm. It's a uh, computer, which we've had for a while. We've had the internet for a while. It's a video camera. It's, you know, audio recorder. People used to take tape decks around and record each other talking. Um, it's just that it's also instantaneous and it's all put together in one package. Mm. But I think because, honestly, the modern cell phone as we know it has has really only been as powerful as it is in kind of what we know today in the last five to seven years. And I think throughout that period of time, we we didn't do a lot of thoughtful development of the tools that the phone actually no, provides to people. Right. And I think we left we left that development in the hands of the first adopters, the first generation of people who understood it, many of them growing up primarily in the analog or in the digital world, excuse me, mm-hmm. not as much in the analog world. So if we had had if if your mother or mm-hmm. you and I or our friends, if we were the ones developing tools to be used on the cell phone f- by our children, mm-hmm. do you think we might not have developed something for them that didn't that didn't do some of the things that these things do? We've been we've allowed ourselves to be led mm-hmm. rather than to be passive. leaders. We've been passive. Yeah. We've been passive. And, mm-hmm. and I think it's an extension. I think about this a lot. This whole topic of um, you know being a strong woman. Um, mentor for you know younger girls because Mm. i know how i was myself at that age um i think a lot of these social media channels they are it's such a hyper sexualization of women and it's basically you know they're dealing with things like prostitution that's pretty much in plain sight we're looking at mass culture if you people like reality tv shows and we're just idolizing and focusing on the wrong things and it becomes very troubling so it's also um so manufactured so So everything's manufactured the Mm -hmm. images that they are looking at on a regular basis are not realistic images now whether they're manufactured through filters you know actual filters that you have on the cameras on your phone or whether they're manufactured because the girls are looking at pictures of women that have had so much work done that they are far from being Mm -hmm. anything that Mm -hmm. these girls can ever um, can ever ascribe to but and you know I know it's I know there's a difference in it right but pornography prostitution cosmopolitan do you remember when we were kids do you remember when yeah. when you yeah. were young and and Cosmo every single week came out and told you girls or Teen Vogue or something probably not Teen Vogue maybe they were a little more gentle but Cosmo certainly came out if you let's say and I was never but let's say I was a 14 year old girl in 1986. If I was getting my clues from the one thing that my mother was reading or that I could find that was about women, it was telling me how to give better blowjobs, how to mm-hmm. how to be sexier. It had mm-hmm. doctored photos of women who were impossibly beautiful yeah, on the I, cover I constantly. Grew up, I I know that very much. It's that, still the same shit. It is, but the problem is there's this. We're talking about the instantaneous. Uh, reaction and the way for people to hide behind maybe a digital veil would they say that to someone in person? and it's different it's different now sam so i'll give you an example because i was that girl no, i too. agree it's different, okay but. so one thing that has changed is that you as the girl as the 12 or 14 year old girl were never in the magazine you weren't making the content okay you yeah. weren't the content and you are the content now so i'll give you i'll because give you because we let it be that we way. have allowed it to be so i'll give you some examples um you are at oh i didn't have my phone let me use your phone jim so you are in class <laughs> yeah. okay yeah. you are in class you are in geometry class and you don't realize it but someone has just right. snapped your picture mm. yep okay because they can't believe that you did your hair that way. Mm. Yep. And they have now uploaded it to social media. Mm-hmm. Yep. This girl's hair is butthole ugly. Mm. Yep. And I you can't walk out of that. you walk out of class and you turn your phone on 
and you have been tagged in a social media post with your image that you had no idea was mm-hmm. being taken. Mm-hmm. And now 45 people have commented on how ugly mm-hmm. your hair mm-hmm. is. You were never the subject. Right, because you weren't, you weren't uploading to Cosmo. Con- it is constant. This you is, didn't, this is exactly a- what we were discussing last night. And it's very different. You know, boys, they don't have that. As, or the kids I'm around, you know what I mean? But girls, they are very, very aware that all girls are going through situations like this. Absolutely. Somebody, you know, we, we were dealing with this. Um, my husband was dealing with this last night. You know, one of his players who it, somebody has a, to give you an example, this isn't the exact situation, but, you know, a little snapshot, a little video uh, Snapchat of, mm-hmm. Um, somebody missing a, 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 a shot. It's an air ball. And mm-hmm. now it's been shared, you know, mm-hmm. multiple times. And now everybody's like, what a horrible basketball player. You should just quit the basketball team. And before you know it, you, you, have, lo- yeah. you have lost your will to live because when you're going to go back to school, everybody's going to see you. And that's what everybody's mm-hmm. going to think, say, and feel, at least in your mind, they will. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think what we have not been prepared to manage or prepared to handle is how do we raise them up through that Mm -hmm. that is a that that is a a a foreign experience for us as women you know when we have daughters we can talk through so many other things that's something that we can't talk Mm -hmm. through one thing that i do one thing that i do think we could advocate for um and i'm not exactly sure how to do so but we we could advocate for it it doesn't seem to your point sam about who's in control yeah it doesn't seem like the people who are in control (laughs) Uh of this electronic digital age are very motivated Mm, to 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 help create boundaries well let me tell you something we are we are actively and honestly working on that and i and i can i'll tell you exactly why because when i was a kid alcohol was was a commodity that a person could buy when i was when i was 12 years old i could walk into a store and i could probably buy my own 22 I don't know that there was a law against me buying a gun when I was a kid. There may have been, but I could certainly have gotten my, you know, an older adult to come with me. I could mm-hmm. definitely buy ammo. Mm-hmm. Uh, cigarettes were still a thing. Pornography was still a thing. Mm-hmm. I was my access to those things was restricted and limited. Mm-hmm. And somehow or other, we as adults have managed to allow the most powerful tool. Mm-hmm. The, the most powerful weapon at times and instrument of good, all kind of mixed into one, we've allowed it to j- basically essentially go unregulated mm-hmm. by us. We have not we have not taken the time to say, right. all right, well, this is a cool thing that you've created social media. But actually, I don't want it, the, I don't want for there to be the ability to have that uploaded. I don't yeah. want phones in my schools maybe it's an absolute uh, flat out ban on yeah, you know, phones in schools you, like, yeah, I, didn't, do I didn't have access allow. to a phone mm-hmm. when I was a kid mm-hmm. they weren't there was a pay phone somewhere mm-hmm. but I got in trouble if I went to use it mm-hmm. do you, you allow know? them for like, no the so yeah. um, I there are a number of districts across the country that have gone uh, no phone districts yeah. um, where you know you have to lock it up when you walk in mm-hmm. to the building every day um, and those those educators, even the parents, are happy mm-hmm. yeah. with that outcome. Um, I can speak intimately, obviously, on behalf of Minneapolis Public Schools. Minneapolis Public Schools has a has a district policy right now that says, in elementary school, you cannot have a phone. Period. Mm-hmm. You cannot bring a phone to school. In middle school, you can bring a phone to school and you can be on it before school starts and after school is over. Right. And in high school, the district policy says that you can have a phone on campus and you can be on your phone during passing time, mm-hmm. during lunch time, mm-hmm. and before and after school. Well. What that's created is a very difficult way to implement Mm -hmm. because basically you're saying, well, during that 55 minute block of class time, you can't be on your phone, but you're all walking around, you know, every other moment of the day and still capturing everything. Um, And so uh, North at North High, um, we came out really strong this school year and said we are going to implement this policy to the fullest. Obviously, the policy allows for you to be on your phone during lunch, during passing time, before and after school. We can't police that, but during class time, we are going to put our foot down and you are not going to be on your phone during class time. Mm -hmm. Um, What we said is that if you take your phone out while class is in session, your teacher will give you a warning, please, you know, Jim, please put your phone away. 
Um, and if you refuse to do so, or if you take it out again, you need to put it on the teacher's desk. Now that is a huge consequence for a teenager. I mean, to be separated from their phone is to like be separated from life. life. Yeah, it yeah, is. but I, we, never, you know, we were passing notes. Right? Absolutely. And when they found us passing a note, shit, you might even get sent to the principal's Absolutely. office for set, for passing so a it's comparable. note. It's comparable. I mean, right? yeah, let alone taking pictures, playing games. Yeah. And, Do you? Uh, and, well, and also cheating. Too. Cheating. Right. And because whatever else you might. How about watching whole movies on Netflix? Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. During I mean, class. Like, we've, <laughs> right? I can imagine. If, what if the note he sent me was a whole movie on Absolutely. Netflix? Absolutely. Wouldn't right. I get in trouble for what? Right? I mean, that's. We need to think of this differently. Right. And I don't understand, and I've talked to other people about this, but... But can I say one thing about we need to think about this differently, Sam? I think that we get easily intimidated by the technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Right? Mm -hmm. Right. So I think it's similar to like when my husband is trying to figure out like how to upload something to Facebook, right? (laughs) And he's like, 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 wait, what button am I supposed to push again? So I think even those of us that may think of ourselves as a little bit tech savvy Mm -hmm. still get a little bit intimidated by the generations oh, sure. under us yeah. because there's so much more tech I know. savvy than us. So well, then we kind of back. So then we kind of. I, I feel like we kind of back off a little bit. Like, uh, whereas we should be doing the opposite, getting back to the film. Yes. Right. We should be pressing into it, making it our business, putting our yes. foot down, and saying no. You and will be the leaders. Right. And I think just one quick thing. It's about holding some of these companies and. Just holding them accountable, accountable. And, and talking about it. Them because and ourselves. And ourselves, too. Yeah. It's the same thing. It's, uh, you know, since we're starting our business, I was just talking about this yesterday. Social media is a part of, needs to be a part of your marketing plan, in right. air quotes here. Mm-hmm. And I hate doing it. And right. I'm going to say it to the, right. the I think we should just stop at some point here. I just think it's... Uh, if we're not going to play the game, then let's really not play the game. It's, mm-hmm. we're, we feel compelled, so we have to create this calendar and put out this content. And I want to put out content that's meaningful, that means something to us. I don't want to be that person that says, you have to post two times a day and one needs to be a video and you need to like and you need to comment. Yeah. It's like, that's a waste of my time. You need to get other people to like and other people to, to comment. Yeah. Right. And meeting people and talking. Yeah, it's sort of a void after. So You know, it's meaningless. Mm-hmm. And it yeah, feels my, meaningless. It is, it yeah. Is. For sure. It is. But it is funny. I just want to, yeah, you know, because I'm so old, you know, the transformation <laughs> of technology, you know, like I remember when Walkmans came out, yeah. you know, and I was in school when that happened, you know, it's like all of a sudden, like, you know, you could listen to music. And I mean, we were, li- we were trying to listen to music in class. Sneaking it. With mm-hmm. headphones on. Right. I mean, it was so headphones. obvious. Can you take the headphones off? Right. Yeah. That was like a big deal. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's just this constant, you know. Evolution. Also, yeah. yeah. I mean, we're, we, but we're, we've we failed to keep up with too. this one. Adults mm-hmm. did. Mm-hmm. I mean, I feel like. Well, my, because it also happened like that. It did. Mm-hmm. It I did. mean, it really did. And I my mean, 10 and 12 year old are, I mean, they're they're taught relatively extensive uh, sex ed. And, and mm-hmm. that, you know, extends back to home where I, you know, do what I think is appropriate mm-hmm. and teach them the rest of it. Right. Mm-hmm. Is there a single tech ed class that they've taken that teaches them not to get on Snapchat Mm -hmm. and that things last digitally that you can, you know, that you Mm -hmm. should not bully each other? Like, is that, why why would we teach this thing? And not the other. And not that, when this seems to be the thing that's really getting to them right now. You're absolutely right. You know, so Mm -hmm. I I think we need to put a program together where... Yeah, you, you you know, you you bring adults in who can talk to them honestly and just say, look, sex is uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sex ed, not every parent loves that you teach their kids sex ed. Mm-hmm. Not every parent is going to love the fact that you teach them tech ed, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But listen girls, don't put yourselves naked on the mm-hmm. on the things. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. someone needs to actually tell a 12-year-old mm-hmm. that cuz mm-hmm. they don't know otherwise. Mm-hmm. They're not sure. Mm-hmm. So no, you're right. We're behind the eight ball on that one. It's yeah, a, but I think it's um, it requires just more discussion. Yeah, yeah, more, more number, talks like this. A number of educators are taking it on themselves, <laughs> of course, know, um, to have those conversations. But there is it, it has it been formalized? No, right. I think I, I right. think it formalized. really needs to be, mm-hmm. and soon. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Mari. Wow. This was this was uh, this, is, this, this was, was great. Like a, a touch more intense than we we didn't even get to the part where we ask you like what do you do for fun, you know all of the rest of it. Would you? I walk into podcasts that I have no idea <laughs> what I'm, yeah. what I'm I don't there know. for. For fun. Was this fun? Yeah. Well, in the beginning, well, it, yeah, it's good, it right? Is, 
Yeah. It, I think it was, I mean, when I say intense, I think in, in the best possible way. Yeah. I, I mean, there was a lot of really good thinking. Well, it'd be fun to carry this <laughs> further, too. You it know, would. Have you come back if you'd like to, you know, because in I fact, you should start one of questions still for you. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. thank you right. for having me. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks, Mari. Yeah, thank, thank you so you. much for coming in. Thanks. Oh, Hopefully anything you, you need people... to, anything you need to want or want to Promote. say? Like how? how yeah, do we always find let people. Your, the documentary. So uh, the documentary is in two places right now. It is on Amazon Prime, um, and it is on YouTube. Mm. They have um, a Love Them First website. That's where uh, the directors and the producers kind of do everything through there. And you can find, it's lovethemfirst.com, and you can find all the links on there. Um, but more importantly, um, I just, I would love for people to feel um, empowered, mm-hmm. I think. Mm-hmm. I, I think I would, I, I just, I want people to feel empowered and not feel like this is what it is and there's nothing we can do about it. And I want people to feel like there is something we can do about it. And maybe that little something is, um a conversation around you know the bonfire with your neighbors mm-hmm. where y- you're comfortable wrestling mm-hmm. and yeah. grappling mm-hmm. yeah um with with things that you haven't been comfortable before maybe that conversation is being willing to uh, challenge kind of um the things as we know it and do some technical adaptations yeah mm-hmm. to our current reality but um i just i really want to encourage people to um just walk their walk their talk you know mm-hmm. so many mm-hmm. people put quotes up around our heroes and heroines of the past our our ancestors our 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 superhumans that did superhuman work and yet um and yet they choose not to you mm-hmm. know um but if that's the quote that you live by then live by it mm-hmm. you know I, I have a hard time believing that mother Teresa needed to take a mental health day you know? <laughs> so but would you hold it against her if she I did? wouldn't but I no. but I think I think like if you you know if you if you really want to embody some of the people who went before us and made sacrifices then be willing to make sacrifices yourself very well said mm-hmm. yeah and I think that's something that uh we're seeing in people that we've had on the show we're seeing in kind of I think it's just sort of second nature in a certain way for us in this group and kind of us, the people we've pulled in. If there's a problem and it needs solving and you don't know the exact next step, you just put one foot mm-hmm. ahead one of, foot the in front of the other mm-hmm. and you just keep going mm-hmm. and you work it out. Mm-hmm. That's right. So, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mari. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. We love comments and feedback, so go ahead and let us have it. If you'd like to learn more about Andolin and other legacy projects, visit the website at andolin.app or kineticlegacy.us. Take care. Mm